What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Can't Afford Therapy podcast, where people who actually can't afford therapy come to a safe space where they feel like they can't. I go by the name Savon. I'm Antoinette. And I am Josh. I hate introducing myself as Josh. Josh is boring. Like well, the word. Give him your street name because we go talk. About, I'm sure we're going to talk about <laughs> some street shit today. I'm sure we're going to get into some things that. I would um, love to know what you were known as in the street. It's, it's obvious. It's my Instagram handle. Face. Oh, duh. Uh, <laughs> did you know that's that? That's my company. Did you put that right together? I, I didn't. I was going to assume. Yeah. That's why I asked. I knew he had a street name, yeah. I but I didn't not. know what it was. Yeah, no. It was on my bingo card. Face. Yeah, but it feels weird too. Like some people call me Face, and I'm like, I. Hold on, don't call me Faze, man. Just call me Josh. Just call you Josh. Yeah, but then I, I hear myself say Josh, and I'm like, that's vanilla as fuck. No. I'm t- you know what it is? That's the hood part of me. That's like, it's like, yo, don't call me about my government, man. That's 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 pretty funny, Josh. I, I don't think of it. I think that it's, you know, it's, it's so my name is not as common, right? Savon. Yeah, you got a sexy name. There's not too many of me Your name is sexy. Like, it is. It's like, like Savon. Don't like, guess You got a please. name that, like, is, Appreciate you know. It. Yeah, man. You know, it, it's funny. So my last name is actually hyphenated, right? So um, I got two last names. One is my mom's maiden name, and then my dad's, you know, my biological father's name. Yeah, progressive. Um, yeah, yeah, because I love it. <laughs> what happened. Good household. They were, they had me so young, they weren't really together. So my dad, it was his ego, like, Man, you ain't getting your mother's name here. Yeah. But what happened was, um, my name kind of flows a little bit better with my mom's maiden name. So right now, I don't have. You want to tell your government? I'm curious no, now. Well, it's all my name. social. So my full name is Savon Slater. Yeah. Right. So that flows a lot better that's a than fire what the name. other. I, so that's, that's why. I What's brought the it other up. one? I'm not gonna put that name out there. Shout out to my dad though. Shout out to my dad. <laughs> nah, what He's you like, mean? Yo, fuck that legacy. You heard? No, mm. you ain't see, carrying uh, on them jeans. You see, look, now you <laughs> yo, <laughs> y'all are so fucked up. I, I, I gotta protect something. I feel you, and I feel like that's the one thing that I do try to protect. Come but, on, boundaries. Uh, yeah, 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 I put I'm, my family on front I, street. I love my dad, and you know that whole. Family. I'll give you a relatable story. I used to use my mom's last name to apply for jobs when I was a teenager. Because mm. my, my, my last name is Perez. Mm-hmm. Them shits used to get dubbed. Okay. <laughs> them shits used to get dubbed. Them resumes got dubbed unless I was applying to be like a janitor or some oh, shit. Damn. Oh, damn. Yeah. So I used to use my mom's last name for like like to get jobs on retail and shit. Got it. Yeah. That's, that's pretty funny. Right. The relationship that we have with our last names, who would I ever thought? I have a strong relationship with my last name. I never want to give it up. Okay. Ever. You, you we never know. want to give Whether it up. I get married or not. you talked about that. He yeah. was like, I'm a Henry. I'm a Henry. <laughs> Damn, I did. Yeah. That makes a lot of... My dad said that to me. Yeah. He said, you a Henry. I, before I left the house, I'm a, But I'm also the last born. He didn't have any boys. And mm. I'm the baby. And, and he didn't have any brothers. So that means that, that in a traditional household... I'm not giving up my name. That means that you would not pass on the last name. So that means that you would not carry on the legacy. No, I'm not giving up my name. I said traditional. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not giving up my name. But, but even if I have... A child, which I'm like, you I don't know if that's gonna name? happen. You gotta find a very progressive man. I no, no, I'm not gonna give him the last name. I, I'm fine with being the last. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fine. I mean, yeah. you should have tried for a boy child. It's so funny. I to tell you because every time you speak about just your last name, because Henry is such like a powerful last name, it, it really reminds me of fucking Game of Thrones. Really, it's like the House of Targaryen, the King, House of Henry, the House of Henry, the House of like, Henry. I mean, yes, bro, like it's King a strong Henry. ass name. It, maybe that's why. Can I tell you though? There's that's a, been a thing. somewhere in my feed. There's an Instagram post where I'm literally I write like. House of Henry. This like these like the all the Game of Thrones <laughs> breakdown mm-hmm. of like my animal, mm-hmm. my flag. It's ridiculous. What animal would you be, House of Henry, before we get started? I was a wolf. Because okay. I love the Stark. That was the Stark. I know, but you I don't were care. Stark. Oh, so you was biting. You wasn't I was even original. Biting. You was supposed I to be don't like care. a giraffe or some shit. Absolutely not. No? But my name is Matt French sounding or Haitian. Mm-hmm. Antoinette Henri. So mm-hmm. most people like when you see that come across their resume. Is that where it derives from? Mm-hmm. From no. Haitian? Hell no. My grandfather's name was Anthony, mm-hmm. and he's Italian. Mm-hmm. And so my mom was like, oh, bet your name is Antoinette. And then my dad's name is just Henry. Your dad's first name is Henry. No, my dad's last, last name, name is Henry. Henry. That's what I'm saying. Is your dad Haitian? No, he just black. Okay. He don't know. He's raggedy. He don't know. We did the little test, and he was unimpressed. We are descendants of slaves. That's what I call Black Americans who don't know where we come from. No, I mean we did the we did the test. He is Nigerian and Ghanaian, and we mm-hmm. even know the tribes. And when we told him, he was like, "I don't 
I'm so it's a slave master's last name at yeah. some point. That's Basically, what I that's believe. what it is. Descendants of slaves. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, that's, that's what Perez is. Perez is like some I'm Spaniard dis- that came and raped someone in my my, my background, somewhere okay. in the ancestry, in fucking Ecuador somewhere. Some poor fucking indigenous <laughs> person got... That fucking rape. That, that, <laughs> that was the end of it. Yeah, and that was just before that. My last name was like like Wak or some shit like that because, of, because that's the Goodbye. last the indigenous last name. The trauma of last names. Here yeah. we go. That's oh, what it is. Who would have thought, yeah. man? Well, before we get into today's topic, as you all know, uh, we like to take a, a major topic, break it down, relate it to us. Uh, but before we get into it, please make sure you comment, like, subscribe. Let us know what you think of the content and if and how you do relate to us. Um, and today we're going to talk about something that when the topic was brought up to me, I didn't really think about it too much. It's not something that lives in my mm-hmm. head. Right. Um, but when you guys asked, Hey, I feel like you may have something there. Think about it. It came to me in about five seconds. And that topic is, um, the relationship and the trauma with violence. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, we, we, we discuss a lot on this podcast, relationship based, friendship based, um, and even listening to other podcasts and platforms, I think we kind of tread lightly around violence because it is so prominent, right? We almost get desensitized to it. Um, so for me, I think I would probably start with being desensitized to violence. Uh, but I want to pass it off to Josh because um, you kind of introduced the topic to us off air. And I would love to know your history because all that you've shared on the pod I'm sure you'd be able to, you know, just kind of guide this ship in a way that myself and I, I'm, I'm going to just speak for you, Antoinette, really quick, that Antoinette may not be able to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think y'all would be surprised. Like, because violence is, there's like, everybody's experienced violence. It's just the levels of violence in which we experience, and it's all subjective. The level of violence that you experience, you may have experienced the same way I have. It's just that it's the levels like if you barely have ever experienced violence and then you go outside right now and you get punched in the face that shit might fucking shock your world mm. you might have ptsd for 10 years because of that but someone like me who's experienced a lot of violence i go outside and punch in the face i'm like all right we're getting the shaking it's all different right it all depends it's subjective to what your like your experience is you said desensitize the more violence you experience the more desensitized you become to it the more you're exposed to it the more desensitized you become to it and i bring it up because i i think we were having a discussion I forgot what it was, but it, I think it was about, we were talking about Philly, and then I ended up talking about <laughs> something in Philly and how the row houses out there is wild, and then it made me think about violence and how these, like, like coming from specific neighborhoods and being surrounded um, mm. in a very specific socioeconomic status exposes you to a level of violence that most people aren't because of the need and the 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 uh, famine mentality that you come from, the the mentality of, like, you know, I need to get, I need to, I, I don't have enough, so I need to get it one way or another. And there's and be, not enough to go around. And because there's not enough opportunity, there isn't enough accessibility to whether it be work or education, we often will find other ways. We, And when I say we, I mean people that come from the hood, whether that be Latinos, whether that be black, whether that, wh- whoever's there, it could be white people too, whatever the case may be. If you are not able to get the opportunities to get educated you will be creative. And that creativity often comes in the form of get it by any means. And um, it made me think about violence and the violence I experienced growing up. And even as a child, the, the violence I experienced growing up because my parents experienced violence, mm. right? Like I, I'll start uh, just to kind of spark it off and I, I would like to pass it on after this and I can go deeper as we the conversation goes. But like, let me go to the very early roots of just my me growing up. My father was... Uh, he hustled in the streets. So my, my dad experienced a ton of violence. He's an immigrant, you know, from Ecuador. He got his ass whooped by my grandma. So that's just uh, immediately, he was his association with violence is with his mom, mm. right? Mm-hmm. So that's uh, the closest relationship you could have is, and you're getting your ass whooped by your mom. Then he grew up in the projects in Coney Island. My man was fighting every day. Yeah. So that's just, it's just a culture of violence. Now let's go to my mom. My mom's mom died of a heroin overdose when my mom was like 13. My mom's dad died of cirrhosis of the liver when she was like 10. You know what I'm saying? So like these are violence. Like whether, you know, like it's a form of violence for you to see these very violent deaths that your family is living. And then now let's talk about domestic violence. My mom and my dad, I I've witnessed a lot of domestic violence in their relationship. So my point is, is that you don't need to necessarily experience violence on your body 
for you to be exposed to it and for it to affect the way that you view violence and the way that you then view relationships and the way that you view the world around you, the way that you cultivate trust and the way that you look at others and the way that you, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I, I bring it up because I'm like, man, violence has affected me mm. and, and it permeates throughout my life every day. To this day, I'll walk out right now, we're recording and I'll look around, I'm like, yeah, all right. Anyone trying to get me out here? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, before I came in here, I have a bunch of stuff in my car. I bring that shit in because I'm like, no one's going to rob me. You feel me? Like, so it's like the idea of violence, the idea of someone trying to get one up on me has it's existed in my life because of the way that I've been exposed to violence growing mm -hmm. up. And uh, I just thought it'd be a really interesting thing to talk about. Yeah. I, I think in today's society, um, I want to take it from... I don't want to start personally. Normally, we like to personalize these conversations and flush them out from a, a personal standpoint. But um, like Josh said, I think we'll get there. I think for me, violence really shows up in my appetite of social media, right? We're mm -hmm. almost desensitized to it from that standpoint to where, you know, rappers are dying at an alarming rate, right? Um, and it's publicized. And not only is it publicized, but we, we're seeing the visuals of some people's heroes, some people's influences, some people's idols, whatever. Like we're seeing the actual videos of these people dying. And, um, you know, the Internet has really played a part in in, in my desensitized. De since I yeah, I can't even talk. Desensitize. Thank you. You got to keep being Shout out to Kirby's Cups. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just not really understanding or, or associating the violence in real life with the internet because it almost seems like two different realities. But it's like, that's somebody's mom. That's somebody's dad. That's yeah. somebody's son, brother, best friend, partner. Um, you know, that there, there was, and, and I'll just keep it in like music rap because those are the ones that kind of hit home because they're younger, right? A lot of the people who are passing away are 30s, not even in their 40s yet. And that's young, that's super young to see anybody's life taken so early. So I remember um, when young Dolph was murdered mm. and even Nipsey Hussle, when he was murdered and their partners, how they partners speak about them once they pass, like, yo, they were on a mission, they served that purpose. And the fact that they were able to handle it in that way, it almost makes you feel like it, it's not real. Like, you, we're not supposed to be able to compartmentalize life and death the way that we do. And yeah, I think a lot of that right. happens because of social media and just how accessible it is. Um, so for me, um, keeping it away from my personal experience for now, I think my relationship with violence today is by my consumption of my digital appetite, what I see on the internet uh, not even so much the music. Like me, I'm an R and B guy for the most part. Like I, I listen to heavy R and B. Like your name's Savon. It gotta be R and B. <laughs> <laughs> like that. That that's where my music kind of lives, right? Um, but you know, everybody enjoys it. Young Thug, me, me, all of these guys. Like I still enjoy that too. There, there's a part of me who relishes that. But even the rap that I listen to, I like listening to the drug dealers. Yeah. Right. I don't really listen to the drug users. Like yeah. I listen to Jeezy, Jay Z, the guys who are actually like that's kind of where. I get my uh, musical appetite from, but I know the masses. It's funny the two rappers around. you mentioned. One shot someone, and the other one stabbed someone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. But but Jeezy what they shot. glorify, yeah. what they glorify is the hustling, hustle. making money. You get what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So I think for me, do you think the ends justify the means? Then is that how we? Um, in some cases, mm. I do. In some cases, I think it's collateral damage and everything, and I don't think it's right and wrong, but it's it's a means. It's it's, and that's a whole nother conversation because that's capitalism and fucking. And we need to get into that one day now. Oh yeah, look, we should definitely write that, <laughs> but um. I just noticed that that you know, my relationship with violence today is more so of it, it's a digital thing. It's something that I consume yeah. because of the internet. The internet fucked us up. It did. Let's go. I mean, think about like the early days of the internet. Like I remember being a kid and watching videos like um, what was that? Two guys, one hammer. Where the those serial killers in Russia were fucking killing people with a hammer in a bag. You and watched that? Recorded. This was on the internet. This I, was, I was watching that when I was like 13. I, didn't, I never saw it. Wow. Wild as fuck. That. It's crazy. Fist fights. I, we used to go to like um, like, like gore.com and like watching crazy shit at that age. That shit was all over the internet for you to watch. Even Worldstar. It yeah. got popular because people were getting knocked the fuck out on the internet. Yeah. 
Like your fear was to hear world star. Yeah. That was the fear. It wasn't yeah. the fear of getting knocked out. It was the fear. Like that's how much we trained our brains to be like, let me not be afraid of getting knocked out. Let me be inf- afraid of someone screaming. The wor- uh, yeah, exactly. Getting exposed for getting knocked out. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 that's us conditioning ourselves to be okay yeah. with violence. You get what I'm saying? Um, even even like sporting events. Anytime there's a pay per view, actually, I think I swiped up, or, or me and Josh had a quick interaction about yeah. a boxing match that's coming up in a few weeks, right? Like that's a violent sport, mm-hmm. and you know I kind of justify it because it is a sport, but it is rooted in violence, right? Um, you think about. And it's so funny. As I get older, I'm looking at things with a new perspective. Like football, I can sit and watch 19 hours of football straight if it's on TV. Okay. Like that is my vice on a Sunday, right? Really? I will complete all. I will no responsibility. Not like that's why I didn't want to record on Sunday. That is one one of the reasons <laughs> I love why. Because that's one of my days. Yeah. Like I don't get many days, and that's yeah. the one day that I had during the season. Um, but even football, like if you really look at what it is, extremely violent. Yeah. It's men in a coliseum mm-hmm. with equipment and gear, protective equipment and gear, like they're gladiators. Crashing into other men. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. It's the, you just the insert modern, a ball and so we, we're okay with it. It's the modern day gladiator. Mm-hmm. It is the oldest sport. I go that far. Again. I think to, like UFC is the modern day gladiator. Yeah, that shit is wild. <laughs> that's another form that, and that's yeah. a whole nother form that's a whole yeah. nother form of it yeah. and it's the same premise saying, it's the though. same premise yeah. you put people in a circle and on a stage <clears throat> essentially it's surrounded bad. by other mere mortals who would never dare step in the octagon as much and as tough as I want to believe that I am you cannot fucking pay me to stand across Mm-mm. from a UFC MMA f- you just couldn't pay me to do it it's interesting I, when when you brought this up, I immediately went to children. I immediately went to the effects of of violence within a child's like brain, and then I also definitely thought about young boys mostly because I I do feel like um, our boys are uh, traditionally brought up to play football, to play these kinds of very violent um, at sports, and to be in these kind of activities that our girls aren't, mm-hmm. right? And I don't think that that is by accident. I think it's very much by design. And um, I also sat with what is violence? What are the different types of violence? Because these days, you know, people will say words, your words are violent. Your words feel violent. And I don't know if I identify with that, but I, I won't, you know, that's a whole other conversation. But I thought about domestic violence. I think as a woman, that's where my head went immediately. I think I thought about sexual violence. I thought about violence as a form of discipline, you know, parental violence. And I thought about uh, definitely violence in the media, like you said. Um, All of them are issues. But when I was thinking about the person who is violent, I, in my mind, and in some of the research that I did, this type of behavior um, is exhibited at a very young age, and something happens within your brain that that can predispose you to be violent. So I immediately was like, I'm, I need to look up how this affects children. Mm-hmm. And the exposure around it, you know, the, the stats is like at least one in seven children have experienced abuse in the past year. And this is in 2020. And this is likely a huge, um, this is underestimated because so many cases are not reported, right? And then you also have one in four girls and one in 13 boys in the United States will experience childhood sexual violence. And I think that's wildly um, underreported as well, especially with young boys, because you have situations where a lot of times you have young boys who experience inappropriate touch, but people dap them up and instead like, no, that's actually inappropriate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I went back with the, with these poor kids and I'm, I'm thinking about the brain and how the brain develops. And I actually have, a, I actually have a clip. Can I play a clip? Yeah, you of course. Okay. I want to play this cause it's important. Uh Oh, child, come don't do me. 
<laughs> oh, I forgot it was screen recorded. Wait until you might. In the sense, those first blocks that go together are the more primitive area, the survival brain. The brain develops from the bottom to the top and from the inside out, so that the normal development of the top part of the brain depends upon healthy development of lower parts of the brain. The top part of the brain, where you do all of your thinking, is the part of the brain that is most changeable, easiest to modify. But unfortunately, if a child has developmental experiences of threat and exposure to domestic violence, the lower parts of the brain will be impacted and they're harder to change as they get older. So if you don't have someone come into your life and intervene and explain like this is actually not the norm, what they're saying is many children grow up and they believe that's the norm. And so they perpetuate that kind of behavior, which, cyclical. Right, which makes complete sense. I thought back to my, of course, I always want to get personal, but my personal experience with violence, personal experience with sexual violence, but with physical violence, I... The only thing that I could think of, and I've gotten to like a handful of fights, maybe all with boys, but that didn't bother me as much. It was the parental discipline. And I wasn't beat. I was never beat beat. Yeah. But when I was hit, I fucking remember it. Yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. And I remember being like questioning that I'm doing this because I love you. And I remember being young and thinking, this is not love. I can learn a different way. This is not love. And the the pathology of that um, and how we carry that through, the, the, you know, the pathology of that goes back to slavery and, you know, and folks being like, mm -hmm. I don't want you to get killed. So, and I don't have enough time to explain this to you. So these are my means. Mm -hmm. And a, a desperate attempt to make sure that young people understand, that their their child, their the, their loved one understands the right and wrong way to to exist in the world. But I just think that it permeates within our community so much. Like you're talking about sports and I'm thinking about football. 95% mm -hmm. of football players are what? They're black. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, they're, they're brown people. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about boxing. That's mostly heavily populated by brown people. I'm thinking about sexual violence with children and a lot of those numbers, despite the fact that, you know, we're quote unquote, the minority, it's a lot of brown girls and boys. Mm -hmm. And so what is, I think there's a, there's something to be said about not being protected in a way that, that helps this kind of, this continuation. Yeah. And it's a lifestyle, it perpetuates it. It's a lifestyle. And like, even in picking partners, so many women will say, well, he, I got to feel protected. And mm -hmm. protection to them doesn't look like he creates a safe space for me emotionally or he's loving. It looks like he could fuck somebody up. Mm. Yeah. And I ask myself, why? You know? Well, that's primitive, though. That's our lizard brain, right? Because yeah. throughout history, if you go back to like when we were like cavemen. You wanted to be with the person that could protect you from the other tribe. You wanted to be with the person that was most dangerous. That's why, like, inherently, a lot of women tend to have an attraction to, like, serial killers. Because mm. it's it's a weird thing, but it's true. Like, really? think about it. Serial killers in jail, they get so many fucking love letters. And it's because just there's a lot of women out there that tap into that lizard brain, and they say, wow, this is a dangerous person. What and is lizard brain? The lizard brain is the primitive brain, the brain that you don't have any control of. Like, they're... They, they actually explained it in that clip a little bit. You have mm -hmm. your survival brain. Okay. The brain that you are not involuntarily tapping into. Mm. It's the part of your brain that when you see fire, you get excited. Mm -hmm. The part of your brain that when you're out in the wilderness, you're like, oh, this is kind of, I feel something here. Mm -hmm. And it's the same part of your brain that when you see a woman that you're attracted to, you get horny. Mm -hmm. Same thing. And it's that primitive brain that tells us like, oh, that man is violent. And if you're a woman, you're like, that man can protect me, can protect our offspring. And... That's just inherently in our DNA from when we were these primitive people who were mm -hmm. fucking in caves and trying to keep our people alive, mm -hmm. right? And it just evolved. It's still there, though. It's still there. Some of it, but some of it is, I just feel like, it's also cultural and cultural. It's socioeconomic. Mm -hmm. Socioeconomic, you know? socioeconomic it, definitely. But my opinion on this is that those socioeconomics existed even in the most primitive ways, right? Like, the 
think about it in, in terms of conquerors and colonizers and the people that came in and took over countries that were maybe not as uh, technologically advanced or not as economically advanced. And they would come in because they had the economics and they were able to take advantage of that. And they were able to steal the resources from other countries that they had a, techno a technological advancement on. So they would come in with their weapons and they would come and they would conquer this country and they would take whatever innovations they had and then move on to the next country. Mm -hmm. And then they would just bleed those places dry, like Venezuela or Panama or these South American countries mm -hmm. or Africa. And that's violence begets violence. So you go, you leave this path of violence in your way, and then those countries just turn into mayhem mm -hmm. because now they just have no resources. And that's where the socio the socioeconomics come in and the way that like the the people with power right use that power use that violence and, and some then, would say that it's violent it is violent yeah. no 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 that's what that's yeah, what i'm trying to say is saying. that it's always been primitive but we don't think about it in that way and tribes did it yeah think about indigenous peoples the comanche used to go around cutting people's heads off mm. you know what i mean so it's like he, as humans innately the most violent wins we evolve we evolve, right? We be, mm -hmm. we evolve, uh, hopefully, into a, a better person. Like, the person I am today is not the person I was in the past, where I recognize that violence isn't the answer to things. That's not the way you, you are supposed to... I want to <clears throat> ask you about that. Yeah. Because, according to scientific research, right? And how, how young were you when you were experiencing this kind of violence? My earliest memory of violence is probably five years old. Okay. So I want to be clear, too, is something else that came up in this research is that people think that babies and that like zero to six months, like, oh, they're babies. They don't know what's going on. They They'll know. be fine. That's actually they're finding that those that predisposition to violence is actually affecting them more because their brains are in such rapid development. More malleable. And so but they're not developing because they the babies are experiencing fear and so the fear before that, right? In utero. Oh, in utero, definitely. Cortisol levels go up in a pregnant. If it's, a pregnant woman is experiencing domestic violence, there your cortisol levels go up. The the brain that is actually developing, the top part of your brain that you mm. use the most when you are experiencing fear, it just doesn't work. Mm. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Mm. So you have all of these children, and I don't think it's I I I connect this to like all of these different kind of. Uh, ADHD and these kind of just like anxiety issue anxiety all of this stuff that these children are experiencing it's like it could be there is a mm -hmm. correlation there so what I'm saying is if you experience that so young right I'm curious to know because technically you should still be violent still be violent yeah so I guess if you're willing to share like what kind of work did you do did you did you have like how did you because because this is saying, you know, children who are stressed often have a hard time bonding and attaching because yeah. they're hyper-focused, like you said, on survival. I'm going to be unbelievably vulnerable right now. Okay. I ex I've experienced a lot of different trauma in my life. I was, I was sexually molested when I was a child as well. Mm -hmm. I, um, and that was by another child, yeah, an older child. And then I also... The crazy thing is, is that as a child, none of my violence was me being hit. Mm. It was me witnessing other people which is, having violence enacted upon which them. Which is just as detrimental. Yeah, yeah, in a different way, though. Yeah. Because what it does is that I wasn't participating in it. What it did was, like, watching my mom and my dad uh, hit each other and, like, just enact violence on each other, it made me feel like a mediator. Mm. So I became someone that needed to calm things down. So I remember like one of my earliest memories, I was like five, six years old and I was in between my mom and my dad as they were fighting and I was crying and screaming for them to stop. Mm. And I was like, please don't fight, please don't fight. And I remember this memory very, very, very vividly. And um, it's a, it, it definitely has affected me. I've talked about this in, in uh, and around the same time as when I was experiencing the, the sexual violence. And all of that kind of was like coalescing at the same time. And I remember... I didn't recognize that violence while it was happening, but I recognized the domestic violence that was happening mm. and recognizing that like, I need to make sure that they don't hurt each other. And I took on this role, uh, very similar to something that you uh, described in a conversation that we had prior, which is like this role of like, I'm protecting my family. Right. I'm keeping them safe from each other, you know? And um, that affected me in my developmental years because then I, I became a problem solver. Someone that needed to make sure everything was good. So you were never violent. 
I, no, I was violent. So okay. we can go on to my later years. And uh, like, and then as I've gotten older, I witnessed violence from my cousins. My cousins would do armed robberies and sell mm-hmm. drugs and pull guns. And I was like, oh, all right. My dad had an M16 growing up. No longer does any of that. My dad is an amazing guy. He's my best friend. But like M16 growing up. So like the, glor- the hood shit was glorified. I grew up in the projects. I grew up in Marlboro projects to be very specific. So like I was around that all day like that's what i knew like oh i had to be had to make sure that i had a gun on me it was on my hip and then going into school i went to school with these ideas that i wanted to be successful and graduate and i remember going into ninth grade and thinking i was going to be in computer science and learn all of the all of these things and like my fourth day in school i was walking through the park and i got robbed Mm. my fourth day i was walking by i was just walking through and i got robbed by four kids four bloods wearing bandanas around their faces. And they took my gold bracelet my dad gave me. And I remember thinking like, yo, I'd never want to feel that vulnerable again. Mm. Right? And um, I I think it was a week later, I joined a gang. Mm. You know what I mean? Like the week later, I was like, I'm going to join a different gang. Mm Fuck. You know? And it wasn't for for revenge, it's for protection. It was just, protection, I wish wish that I was that smart at that time. Because it was really subconscious. I seen the opportunity and I was like, I want to be like those motherfuckers robbing people. Okay. You know, it wasn't even on some like uh, I'm gonna get back at them or uh, I'm gonna make sure this never happens to me again in that way. I I can retroactively like in retrospect I could say yeah that's why I did it. But in the moment it was more like, all right y'all doing that. that I guess that's what I should the time I should be on. Did Did you ever um discover who did that? Do you know who 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 those guys? Later were? on I did. On, they were grown out? men. Okay. All they right. were grown men. I found that like mm-hmm. 18, 19 year olds. I was mm-hmm. thirteen. Okay. Right. So I, I ended up finding out who they were and. It, you know, it is what it is. But mm-hmm. I, and then I joined a gang and I, in Spanish Harlem, I was living in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. So I would travel on the train to go, go get blessed into a gang. Yeah. I'm talking about fighting on 116th street yeah. to go join a gang, yeah. like really, really wild things. And you know, this is at 13 years old. And then, um, and then that progressed. That was my whole high school career. How did you cope? I had a lot of anxiety. And I remember at night by myself, a lot of the times I would think about it. And uh, I think one of the most unfortunate things was that because I had a father that would always try to do his best, Mm -hmm. like my mom had a restraining order on my dad. So my dad would try his best to sneak around and try to see me and try to make sure I was doing good in school, but he couldn't. That was just Mm -hmm. the facts. He just couldn't. It was really difficult for him. He would do it by almost any means. He'd pop up, but he wasn't living with me. I was living with my great grandmother at the time who had dementia. I couldn't, my mom was like with different boyfriends, so I really wasn't around her at the time. She'd pop in and out every once in a while. So like I had a lot of independence growing up. So I can make my own choices and I can do whatever I wanted to do at that age. Did it feel like independence? It did. I had freedom. I could do whatever the fuck I wanted, you know, at 13, 14 years old, 15 years old. I had to, and then on top of that, my great grandmother was the person that lived there was one of my cousins who at the time was like a jailbird. He was wild. They was a part of a very infamous group of people that if I said the name, people would know who they so were. So it was just cyclical. It was just everywhere. Everywhere in my life was violence, wildness. And then on top of that, this was my mom's side of the family. These are white boys. So they got in tr- They got away with shit that I would never get away with. I see. They would call me Spick. I would be fucking, I would experience so much like racism from people who were my family. And like, and they bullied violent. me. That's violent. Absolutely. I got thrown into. That's where language my is great, violent. Yeah. What? We laughed about it earlier, but that's where language is violent. Absolutely, yes, that is a way where language definitely can be it's emotional translated abuse, as violence. Yeah. It's abuse. It's abusive. Like I, I got thrown in. Like my great grandmother threw me in a closet and called me a sissy, Mary. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's like there's these experiences that I had that are definitely all kind of coalesce into what is violence. How do you, how do you go through that and you wind up here? I think. What what does that work look like? It looks like a lot of failing. Mm. right um to be completely honest it took a huge life event like i've almost died multiple times gotten shot at got stabbed um multiple of my best friends are currently doing basically life sentences uh and one of the biggest things was i'm not sure if i want to share this so i a really my best friend He's dead right now. Rest in peace, Billy. But my best friend was involved in the same situation that I was involved in. And I remember I was told that 
this person wasn't showing up, wasn't taking part in the activities that we were taking part of. So there needed to be consequences for that. And I was told that I had to enact those consequences on that person. That I had to do it. I had to be the one to to enact violence on someone that I loved. Mm. And that was a decision I made to leave. I mm. said, I'm not doing that. That's where I draw the line. That's my best friend. I love him. So I remember I went to him and I told them what, they had, what, what was said to me by an adult, by the way. I'm 16 at this time, 17. And I told him and I said, that's not happening, my brother. We out. And whoever wants it, they can get it. Mm -hmm. I remember that very specifically. And we held up in this apartment that I had that didn't have any parents in it. Mm. And we had guns and we was like, all right, if they show up, they show up. And uh, that was like a really formative moment for me. Yeah. Because it was a moment where I finally chose violence for the right reason. For me. Mm -hmm. Right? I chose violence to defend someone that I loved. And um, thankfully that never transpired into anything that was explosive and uh, a lot of events happened within that entire experience, but I uh, I chose my education after that, and uh, I uh, took an entirely different path in my life. And I remember I took a long look in the mirror at that point in my life, and I said, oh, "Man, I'm I'm not doing life good." Mm. Mm. You know, I just it was like, "I'm not doing life good at all." And I was I remember thinking to myself, "I'm not making my dad proud. I'm not making anybody proud, and I got to start doing the right thing." And probably most importantly, you weren't making yourself proud. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, I, I believe that anybody who has the ability to almost change, and I don't want to say you change who you are because who you are today is who you've always been. You just didn't have the outlet or the space to be that. You mm. didn't, you, you weren't allowed to be that. From what you're telling us, yeah. you know, you, you weren't allowed to be that. And sometimes, uh, growing up in certain environments, you aren't allowed to be who you are. And, you know, um, you know, we record so many episodes. So on one of the previous episodes, I spoke about my village, right? And and my village allowed me to be me, yeah. which is how, you know, today I can champion the kind they of music. They nurtured it. They did. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't sound like you had that, right? But that doesn't mean it wasn't always in you. Because who you are, the great dad that you are, the great leader that you are, the man that you are today, it was always there. But the space and the environment that you grew up in, it just wasn't, it, it didn't encourage that. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? So um, I want to salute you for, Appreciate you know, the evolution of who you are and how you got here. Because a lot of people, they can't overcome those things. They even get lost in it. Like, um, so, you know, my, my family, my <laughs> my dad, and I won't even say like, you know, he, he was in and out of jail for a little bit and everything. But um you know, when you when, when people associate jail and prison, they they have a stereotype of who that person is. Right. Mm -hmm. They believe that, hey, he did something bad. He's bad. He's wrong. She whatever. Right. Um, and I was able to really identify with nuance early on because um, my father, he was locked up when I was younger. Right. He had me super young. So he was still growing himself. My dad was 16, 17 years old, 15, 16, actually. Uh, he was a baby. So, you know, I, I give him so much grace for it. Um, but I never looked at my father like he was a bad person because he was locked up but because he was going through whatever he went through. I always was able to understand and identify the nuance in that. Um, and so you see it all the time. I remember talking on the phone with on, on jail calls with my pops and a lot of his people that he was locked up with. You know, I would talk to them and hear some of their stories. And then as you get older, you almost expect people who are locked up to have a different side to them that you normally wouldn't see. Like most people act out of survival. And what Josh described is you are almost acting out of survival. I'm going to lock myself in this room with these weapons, with my friend, because this is how I'm going to survive. I don't even trust being out in the real world because if they catch me lacking, it could be up. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit in this room, and I'm going to survive. I'm going to protect myself the way that I know how, whether it's a violent way or not. Um, so, again, I, I definitely want to salute you I appreciate um, on that because Same. that's a lot. I think, and I want to thank you for sharing, too. I I think you, the survival component is, is so key. And my question, because I hear you, you had a life event and you were like, okay, I'm going to change, right? And you can change, right? People... People go on and they live their lives. But I really feel like you you have actively chosen to live an expansive life. Mm 
yeah. right? One where you are self-actualized, one where you're like, I am going to be the best version of me. Yeah. And I guess my question is, where does that, because I, I of course I'm coming at it from like this scientific, yeah. of like your brain. Make it make sense. Yeah, because it's like you, you actively told your brain, and it says here, you know, like your our brains have the capacity to heal themselves. It's yeah. like skin. Neuroplasticity. There it is, right. Like literally neurons come in that bitch when you want them to, and mm -hmm. you're like, do, 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 and they are patch doing patchwork. Yeah. When you make that shift and you're like, okay, I've been surviving, but I really want to live yeah. and I want to flourish. Yeah. That's a different kind of work. Yeah. Because you could have just chose, you know, all right, I no longer want to be this person and live in this way. I don't want to constantly be in survival mode. I need to just do better and live my life. Yeah. But instead you were like, no, 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 no. I'm about to flourish. I'm about to have abundance and I'm about to live an inspired, intentional life. Yeah. That's different. I don't think, I think that's where I am now. I don't think that's where I was in that moment. Of course. I think that I just shifted what survival meant. I think before survival meant being in the streets and building up a reputation and, and, and uh, living up to the expectations of what the streets wanted for me. And I think I had to shift it because I realized that what my expectations, I remember you said something where you're like, you're not proud of yourself. I remember when I was a really little kid and I was like, I want to be a lawyer. And I thought back to myself, I was like, yeah, you're not going to be a lawyer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Look at you. You're a fucking low life. So there's a lot of that. And then if I'm being honest, my parents, they never enacted violence on me. Mm. So both my parents were amazing in their own way. My dad was, my dad showed me what it meant to be a father. Even when he had a, a restraining order, even when my mom would do everything that she could to keep him away from me. Even when she would do all these terrible things in terms of their relationship, my dad always made sure to show up for me. Mm -hmm. If it was Easter, I had an Easter basket. If it was Christmas, I got a gift. If, 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 if I was going to school and there was homework, he was fucking making sure I did that shit some way or another, even if he couldn't talk to me. And this is, you have to realize, this is the time where cell phones really weren't a thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Internet wasn't a thing. There was no, you had to keep up with your kid by, where's my son? It's mm -hmm. funny you say that because even the years that my dad was locked up, I remember doing homework with him over the jail phone and hearing the countdown of you have 10 seconds on yep. this call. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I think it's- That's secure. It's, that's it's, secure. It's, it's a dope connection to have. It's dope to be able to relate in that fact because yeah. we hear so many stories about fathers not being present. We hear so many uh, excuses. We give jail as an excuse as to not be present. Like mm. we accept the streets taking yeah. away fathers so often that you said your dad was in the street, my pops, he was in the street, he was locked up or whatever. But I remember having those calls with him and, and it's almost like he didn't really miss a beat. Yeah. And so he was I, on it. He he was on it, right? Like, yo, what's your, let, let's do this math homework. Yeah. You know, let's use this 10, eight minutes we got on a collect call to do So somebody whatever. still intervened. You get what I'm saying? Like he was still there. He he still showed up. So yeah. I think, you know, um, just the fact that is is uncommon. Right. We always hear the dad that goes to jail and it fractures the relationship um, or the dad who's in the streets. And it, you don't have that example because his love is the streets where it's like your dad, you know, regardless of what he was doing, he yeah. showed up for you. The thing is, is that I think it's because as humans, we know the easiest thing to do is nothing. Hmm. So when we see someone like our fathers who in even the most difficult situations made a decision to show up for us, mm -hmm. it means the world. And I don't want to discount my mother. While my dad taught me the responsibility of being a father and showing up, my mom showed me empathy. Mm. I can go to my mom with anything. 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 I remember I thought I had a girl pregnant when I was like 13. And I told her. Mm -hmm. I felt safe enough with my mom to tell her that. I, didn't, I wouldn't have felt that way with my father. Got it. I felt like he would have judged me and been like, yeah, you made some bad decisions. My mom would be like, all right, we're going to figure it out. So the, the theme that I'm hearing is that even though it, it might not have looked the way that we all wanted it. It was we, dysfunctional. It was dysfunctional, but we there was still some someone intervening, someone mm -hmm. putting some kind of love and care into us. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the when it comes to violence and especially violence within our community, community is really important. Yeah. I I remember and. What did you say to me earlier today? You were like, damn, you love a project. What did you say? Uh, you love a charity case. A charity case. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say that I'll. my dad was in social work growing up, and I'll never forget him saying 
when he saw like my, the friends that I had and mm -hmm. especially little boys I might have been interested in. He said, if you want to go into social work, do that, but don't bring them into your home. <laughs> yeah. And so, but I, I will That's say that it's really important. Community is life. And so when you see that, right, just offering, you don't know what your time and energy or your, your one little like young boy, come here. Like, let me put you on the game real quick. Mm -hmm. Or just saying hello to the kid that lives in your area that you oh. see mm -hmm. might be floundering a little bit. And you're just like, I see you. Yes. Let me, let, That's so important. Let me tell you how much this resonates with me. Okay. And and the truth in that is that I make a very intentional... I mean, even right now, Chris is sitting right now behind a switcher. My man, Chris. Chris is an example of this. And what I mean, like, Chris didn't... And I'm not saying he needed me at all to be some kind of mentor for me to help him out with anything, but I make an intentional choice to find people who want to do what it is that I currently do for a living, mm -hmm. and I try to help them in any way that I can, yeah. because I wish I had that when I was coming up, mm. and and I didn't, and I make I know that I have the potential to impact others, and I know that my presence alone can impact others. So I try to do that as much as possible and offer value wherever I can. Mm. So it's so true. Mentorship. I mean, you're offering mentorship. That that kind of, I mean, we said that violence is so deeply rooted, right, in a lack mm -hmm. in socioeconomics. Mm -hmm. You're offering people work. You're offering people means. That is so important because, th again, this feels like it's by design. The projects mm -hmm. are by design. You're mm -hmm. living on top of one another. It's literally set up in a way where, like, what the fuck do you think is going to happen up in here, right? Um, so I, again, I salute you. I, I, I find you to be incredible. Go ahead. So much so when you when you say it's by design, right? So um, a few months ago, there was a story that broke. I don't know if y'all heard about it, but there was a, a murder on the Upper East Side, right? Mm -hmm. uh, about 96th Street, 95th Street, in that area. Um, and the night before the murder... I remember looking outside my window and just seeing cop cars out of my window all night, but no sirens. I live near two hospitals, so I'm used to hearing sirens. Mm -hmm. I'm used to seeing the, the the flashing lights. You know, I'm almost accustomed to it just because of, you know, proximity. That's where I live. Um, so I didn't really think much of it. And the following morning, the news broke that there was a man who executed a woman in broad yeah. daylight next to a school in front of children. Yeah, right my window of my apartment faces that is i heard the gunshot i was on the phone with my father while the gunshot happened but again i'm I'm not thinking of anything i don't think is a gunshot you know again the the area the zone the way that they set up life is the projects are over here this is the good area and the only reason why this was such a major story it was a horrific story but the, the driving point, the headline of the story was a murder on the Upper East Side, yep. right? And it was the fact of the location that it happened. Because that's not by design. Because that's not by design. It's so out of the norm. It doesn't happen here. It doesn't happen here. The mayor lives six blocks up from it. So, oh my God, there's no way this can happen in front of a school. And, and it, was, it was horrible. But I just remember, you know, um, the city bike station that the young lady was killed at is the city bike station that I use when I want to use a city bike. Like, it's that close to home. Yeah. Um, and I remember thinking that, um, you know, a, a mother lost their daughter, a child, because in, in, in this situation, um, the guy executed a woman while she was pushing yeah. a stroller. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so it's so many different factors. I remember factors. when I read about that, and I was just... For me... Again, it's right outside my window. It's on my front step. I walk by it every single day to go to the gym, to get groceries. If I want to do anything in life, I almost have to pass this street reminder. by. It's a constant reminder. And the following morning, I still had to go to work. I still had to clock in. I'm looking at, at looking at everybody walk up and down the same street that this young lady just died on. So many lives were affected in that day by the violence, but yet we're conditioned to continue to go, you know? I wish I had the strength that day to tell my bosses, I don't want to work today. 
I didn't know that woman. I didn't know that baby. I didn't know anybody who witnessed it. Thankfully, I didn't witness it. I didn't happen to just be outside right. of my fucking apartment. But in the same breath, it was so heavy. You didn't have to witness it, it to feel that energetically. So right. fucking heavy. You're human, man. For the next few weeks, just knowing that life was lost and we're all just, we, we all just go on. Life goes on. Life just goes on. Well, that's capitalism. And so it, capitalism and, and, and a ton yes. of other factors and also it being is. desensitized. In its own weird way, but... It's capitalism and it's also being conditioned and being trained to know the show must go on is almost how they enact life. Life must go on. And, and to a degree, obviously, it is super true. But I just remember um, how prevalent, you know, it, it was such a violent act and we're just trained to keep going. And there was a day where... I just wanted to chill. I just wanted to process mm -hmm. what had happened because I could see it so vividly. I know that street like the back of You're my head. You're literally hand. describing the neurons in your brain needing to heal. You're literally describing like, I had this feeling and like, <laughs> it's literally your brain saying something happened. Fear is here. Like I'm, I'm shutting down. I'm having a hard time functioning and you needing to take, like when people say, I need a second to process, that's real shit. Mm -hmm. And that processing looks like literal, like healing mm -hmm. of what just transpired. Mm -hmm. Like we're not robots. Mm -mm. And I think it's really important that you said you needed to take that time. And I hope, I hope this doesn't ever happen again. Mm -hmm. But with the world that we live in, I hope that when you do, when you are faced with something where you feel like you need to process, you give your, you, you make space for that and you, you know, you allow yourself, you give yourself permission to process it. Yeah. It, it, it was a really, really tough few days after that. Um, just all the factors, you know, a mom, a baby, execution, broad daylight. Um, there's a playground right in front of where the whole murder took place. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's two sides of the coin, right? Because in the same breath, I had just started or maybe finished playing Call of Duty where the objective mm. is to kill your opponent, to win the game. And again, you know, um, being a, a bit dramatic, but in the grand scheme of things, That's not dramatic. I feel what it, you're it, it's like, you know, when, when murders happened in Buffalo, right, a few months ago, when a guy live streamed and almost gave you a first person view of killing older, targeting black people, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. on our community, on people. I had a friend at the time who lived in Buffalo and I'm, panicking calling him because the, the the guy who murdered these black people he said hey i'm gonna drive over an hour to yeah. this community to this destination to kill these people you specific. know it was very targeted yeah. it was specific so i remember calling my friend who lived in buffalo at the time and checking on him and making sure he's okay but also remembering that there was a live stream and I avoid these like the plague. I never want to see the, like hearing about it is enough. I don't need to click on the link. So I, I, I didn't watch it, but no. you see the thumbnail, you've seen the screen grab and you know what that looks like, right? And we're just so desensitized to it. Mass murders, Sandy Hook, 9-11 um, was just, and again, I don't know when this episode is going to come out, but still 9-11 is a thing. All of these mass murders that, you know, is, is, it was um what was texas there was something that uvalde. happened uvalde right and it's so bad that i can't remember something so tragic it's because not bad. so much of it happened i hope that you don't judge yourself about that because i feel like that is a self-preservation as That's well what i was gonna say it's, you know it, it's so it's a mm -hmm. miracle that black and brown people and people in general just function are able to fucking function with all of this going on yeah. and to be productive and to produce and I don't want to keep talking about capitalism, but that's what the fuck it is. It's like, keep producing, keep producing. You're a cog in the machine. Keep going. Who cares about humanity? Who cares about life loss? Just keep going. And so you have to block certain things out. And, mm -hmm. and the fact that you're even observing that, that you're doing that and feeling away means that you are still connected to mm -hmm. your humanity, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. If I can, I do want to ask a question to the two of you, because I don't think this is something that is brought up enough. Mm -hmm. And this just affected a dear friend of mine. Um, ab abuse within a relationship, a domestic violence. Um, often we talk, when we think about domestic violence, most people immediately think about a woman being hit by a man, right? 
we're not having enough conversations or resources for men being hit by women. I have a friend who was just hospitalized by his partner and, and, and reached out to me seeking help. And he was like, do you know anybody who specializes in helping men process that, like this? And there were almost no resources. And so I know women in my life who have been physically violent towards their partners. And I'm curious, I don't know if you want to, sh don't share, don't not, but I'm just curious, like, if you know that to be, like, a fact in your communities and your friendship groups and everything else, and, like, what, <laughs> how do you feel? Because I feel like there's a lack of protection there yeah, and a lack of care. Mm -hmm. And, you my know, I could. used to beat my dad's ass. See? But my, but the. Yeah. But what? What's the but? Well, because. My mom, my mom used to fuck my dad up. My mom was the abusive one in the relationship mm. until she wasn't, until my dad snapped and fucked her up one day. And like, I remember I'd look back on it retroactively, like retrospectively, and I'm like, it sounds fucked up, but I'm like, I get it, bro. Like, like when you got someone that's like fucking abusing you as much as, oh man, I like and I want to clear this up. Josh saying I get it doesn't mean he condones. I don't condone it. No, yeah, you're right. I, I absolutely do not condone it. It's just that I understand being in the situation where you're just like, I can't do this anymore. You know, like, not only my mom hitting my dad or like, I, I see my, my my mom fucking threw a cologne bottle on my dad and split his head open once, threw a fish tank, a 30-gallon fish tank on his head while he was sleeping on the futon. Like, wild shit. My mom was wild. My mom put sawdust in my dad's car where it broke down in the middle of a throughway. Wow. So like, I, a lot of shit. My mom, I'm blasting my mom right now, <laughs> but my, my mom cheated on my dad in front of me, sexually. So my mom did a lot of fucked up things, things that if my partner did to me today, I don't know how I'd react. You feel me? Yeah. So like when I think about that and I put myself Shit. in that perspective, I often think like, surprise, my dad didn't kill her mm -hmm. considering where he came from. You know what I mean? And I also I often think like, damn, my dad had a lot of fucking patience, and he does have a lot of patience. My dad has a lot of patience, so I, I empathize with my dad. I also empathize with my mom. They were kids when they got together. I give them yeah. a lot of grace. But when you bring up this question of like, do I understand the idea of women abusing men? I absolutely do. Well, how does that feel if you don't have like resources or support, or I don't even feel like it's spoken about? I think that you're taught. I'm going to speak very specifically for like Latino culture, at least the culture that I grew up around, the machismo culture of like, mm. you're the man. Deal you with what? that shit. Don't so be a bitch. So you deserve it? Oh. Nah, you know, it's not that you don't, you deserve it. It's just that it comes with the territory. I don't agree with that. But that's what you're taught is like, you're the man. Deal oh. with it. That's what comes with being with a woman. This, the, 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 the passion, the intensity, you know what I mean? The, the, the craziness, like... It's like, yo, you're the man. Deal with it. Put your woman in check. You know what I'm saying? Do I agree with that shit? Absolutely fucking not. It's toxic, you know? But that's a lot of what permeates through culture. Black culture, too. Yeah. Very similar. There's not much of a difference, you know? Yeah. Just yeah. the fact that I can do this and feel yeah. safe enough and that, like, I'm not going to leave here and, mm -hmm. and like, someone's going to be like, what are you, a fucking, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. And I want to commend you because I think coming into this episode, me and Antoinette both said, hey... We're going to lean on you heavy, yeah. you know, and, and not that we don't have anything to share. Cool. But I've been abused a lot. I think. I just think that, and, and I'm sure she's gone through things. I've gone through things. I think you, being that you approached us with the topic, I felt like it was like, all right, he has something to say here. Yeah. So it's not that I haven't been through shit, but, you know, I, I knew that I was going to definitely lean on you for your stories, for your encouragement. And I know there's listeners who are also going to relate to to everything that we had to bring to the table today. But um, I, I was ready to gracefully bow and say, yo, he's going to be MVP this episode. <laughs> I I don't even want that. Like, I don't want MVP. I feel, nah, I'm by <laughs> but most valuable <laughs> player. We, hey. we have to stop these. Nah, these I'm competitive. The struggle Olympics. Hilarious. I know we still me. Getting to like know each other. Jesus I got like the, he, 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 you said it. He was going to carry the episode and that he did. And he carried it through being vulnerable. And yeah. so I want to, uh, again, salute you. Uh, I appreciate you coming on this platform with two strangers, two people that you don't really know and, and giving it up the way that you did. Answering that, you too, like you, you always give it up. So um, I want to thank y'all both. 
people yeah. are sharing this platform with me and just opening up the way that y'all do and helping me open up in certain aspects. Like maybe this episode, I was a little bit more reserved because I wanted to I don't think really so. think. You mm -hmm. know, I, I wanted, I, I love to see the interaction between you. You and, share a story about talking important. to your father yeah. and doing homework with him while he's in jail. You think you didn't open up? Yeah, well, maybe I'm so it's normal to me that I don't think it's opened up. Like that's, that's my story. Open, you know uh, what I'm bro. saying? So there's something beautiful yeah, yeah, yeah. in that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank don't, you. Don't I diminish that, that, man. Definitely I, do. I hope that we, um, that all the listeners, that that all of us. I think they're. I'm not going. I know I'm woo woo. And I'm like oh love love. But I can't lie and say that I don't have a pocket knife and I can't, I walk home with it, mm -hmm. you know, at night. I'm not going to sit here and say that I don't do that. Mm -hmm. I, I hope, though, that as we move throughout the world, that one, we continue to foster community and look out for those who we see struggling, who we see that might get swept up in this, who do need and require love and to and, and nurture, right? And then I also hope that, like you said, I hate the idea of stay ready, but stay ready, but also choose choose as many other options as possible mm. before violence. Absolutely. I love that. Um, and yeah, and take care of ourselves mm. when we do happen to experience it, whether it's firsthand, secondhand, thirdhand, whatever way we're consuming it, when your brain needs to fucking heal mm -hmm. and your heart needs to heal, to give yourself permission to do that. I love that. Yeah. I feel like that was our solution for this episode. So thank you, Antoinette. Sure As thing. always. Give yourself space. <laughs> um, again, if you enjoyed this episode, give please yourself give yourself yes, space. Give yourself space and make sure you comment, like, subscribe. Um, I know, you know, we probably should put a trigger warning yeah. at the top of this episode. Yeah. But if you made it this far, we we hope you enjoyed the content that you could relate in some way, shape, or form. Um, and, and if you do have a problem. Uh, expressing yourself due to violence, uh, please, please, please seek the necessary help. Take those necessary steps uh, because, again, we we just want to create the conversation in a safe space here on this platform. But just like we're doing the work on ourselves, we hope that you guys and we encourage you guys to do the work as well. So, oh, at me, man. My DMs is open. Always, man. We appreciate it. And again, what an emotional labor. We, <laughs> <laughs> we hope you guys join us on the next episode of the Can't Afford Therapy podcast. Until next time, y'all. Thank you both.